anything that is like anything that involves ownership in the physical world will be you know there will be an nft application that gets developed for that Today, I want to set this goal so listeners and watchers, viewers, understand what the goal is today, is to get advisors to understand that they can no longer dismiss you know, crypto. We, I think I've kind of covered that before, but now as we get into the NFT space, the DeFi world, Web3, you, we can't dismiss it anymore, um, and we need to start to understand it. And you know, if you see, this is the first time I've ever changed my name on these. My name on this video is JV Stan. I am a Jack Butcher Stan. Like I am a super <laughs> fan um, from the days of the Visualize Value calendar, uh, the printouts. I have about six months in a binder where I was doing it every day. Um, and that was, awesome. that's how I first found you. And then everything that you've put out just really resonated with me. Everything from that to the courses, to the visualizations that you do for, for VV inspired me to do some of my own. And so I just continue to follow your career and I want to take a moment and you didn't know how to do this. I want to take a moment and give you your roses from, from me at least before we go on, because we don't do this enough. And I just sit back and look at visualized value and, and kind of where it's gone and not knowing all of the planning that you put behind it. But I can see that it was not by accident that it went the direction that it went. Like you are extremely brilliant and I can see where the calculations were, where me watching it live, I'm the type of person who just runs and doesn't plan. I just, I just do shit while I'm watching it live. Like, Oh, like he did that to get to here, to get to here, to get to here. And then I think the NFT thing was just a little bit of luck that like all of that great work you did and the NFT boom came and here you are, but you are one of my experts when it comes to the crypto space and especially what we're going to talk about today. You've got your podcast, not investment advice. I never miss an episode every Thursday. I know it's coming on. You guys cracked me up, but like I am listening to it because you are 10 steps ahead of everybody else I'm following who they're 10 steps of most other people. So that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to have you come in and, and, and talk about, you'll get a little bit of the background of kind of how you got into this space, but then what you're seeing and you have a way of explaining things both visually and verbally that most people struggle to do very clearly. So I'm hoping that we get some people um, to understand and, and also get people listening to not investment advice. Cause even though it's not investment advice, I'm a proud owner of a crypto solely because you <laughs> mentioned it on the show. And that day I went out and bought the cheapest crypto I could find. And it was awesome. Uh, but that, that's not investment advice either. So anyways, nah. um, so I'll quit rambling, but I wanted to make sure that I, I gave you your roses because, um, you know, we've interacted before you've come to the community. I don't know how many times I'm going to get an opportunity to sit down and chat with you. And I really do respect what it is that you do, how you do things. Um, and you inspire me. So I just wanted to tell you that right out the gate and not miss the opportunity. Um, so with that real quick, just give your background. My listeners should know who you are because I talk about you all the time, but, um, your background real quick, and then just dovetail right into kind of your exposure to crypto and how you stumbled into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my background, I'm a graphic designer by trade, sort of cut my teeth in New York city agency scene, Madison Avenue, traditional agencies, digital agencies, boutique agencies basically any kind of creative shop. And then in 2017, started my own agency. And uh, that went well for a, a little period of time, but then quickly decided, burned out that uh, I didn't want to grow a, an agency in the traditional sense. I didn't want the dozens of team members and the office in the city and all of those things. So I just like really, really niche down agency services into what is now visualized value. But what then was just like, you know, very specific graphic design for people who help, needed help visualizing intangible concepts, concept, con, con, complex concepts, sorry. So um, I actually worked with a bunch of people in financial services, supply chains, uh, software, all sorts of people that have product that isn't physically visible. Carl Richards, actually, I think yep. I was, I was, some big overlap I was gonna make there. that connection, yeah. Everybody, everybody's a fan of Carl, so uh, I was gonna mention that, but yeah. Yeah, Carl's a yeah, Carl's a legend, good friend now, and um, that slowly morphed into what is now not a service business. So Visualize Value does a bit of um, there's many branches of it now. So we have the the design, the artwork that is 
a product into itself. We do some merch stuff. Justin, thanks for uh, yeah. repping the NFT today. And um, we also do, uh, I've just gotten involved in this Not Investment Advice podcast, which is kind of a side project with um, a couple of good friends, Bilal and Trung. And crypto and NFTs has really sort of, as you mentioned, snuck up on the app working on the application side of crypto and nfts has really snuck up on me like i got uh, involved and invested a few years ago just based on you know having friends in technical places that i trusted with things that i couldn't figure out i was like okay it seems like they know what they're doing they were in it a, a little bit earlier than me I actually worked with a crypto hedge fund as one of the first visualized value clients back three four years ago and the cto of that fund was um was buying bitcoin for a, a dollar bill that he used to send in the mail to people so he was on uh he was on the bitcoin trend before most people it was like user 300 on bitcoin.org or something so like proper old like og bitcoin yeah. and listening to him for a few weeks was enough for me to be like okay i need to be materially invested in this but then you know, just thought of it as an asset class, like stick it in the portfolio and just go back to work. And then earlier this year, I have a couple thousand people in the visualized value community that are either in there purely from the uh, calendar, the the daily manifest that we talked about before, Justin, where, um, you know, people who bought a product two years ago, two and a half years ago, that are still part of the Discord community we run, or they've gone through a visualized value course. And a few people just started reaching out to me because all everybody in that community comes from a different background. There's people like yourself in financial services, there's like creatives, there's um, personal trainers, lawyers, doctors, there's all sorts of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, it wasn't something that we built around a skill set. It was more built around like, uh, you know, a desire to communicate more effectively, which is applicable to everyone. And a few people who had crypto backgrounds started reaching out to me late last year about NFTs. And I was I, pretty dismissive of it, honestly, to begin with. I looked at a couple of the platforms. I was like, I don't really get what this is. Very, very difficult to, um, to even figure out how to use the UI back then. Late mm -hmm. December was like, what is a wallet? How do I, like, I just want to create an account and get Wait. involved in this thing. So I... So in December of last year, you were at what is a wallet phase, and here you are today. Wow! Correct. I knew I'm what a wallet was story. in terms of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a wallet in terms of like cold storage to mm -hmm. to like, you know, hold assets, but a wallet as a device to like log into a website and use the the features of a uh, product was foreign concept to me until probably February of this year. So you're talking like and MetaMask, like a MetaMask wallet. Exactly. Okay exactly uh, metamask rainbow anything that help anything that makes it possible to log into a site or connect to a, a website and yeah the the after about five people reached out to me i was like okay maybe i should take this more seriously and um foundation was a platform that i just started experimenting with auctioning one of one art on um and that was kind of the baptism of fire just figure out the metamask put some ethereum in there mint a piece auction it off um and already had obviously some distribution built in with visualized value and my personal account that i've been just putting time into over the last couple of years and you know little did i know there was already a bunch of people in that audience that were that had been in this space for three months four months or however long before that so sold a few pieces and then since then, I've just been sort of down the rabbit hole. I have to admit, originally when I was selling it, I was like, this is this is totally nuts, right? Like I'd gone from the really struggling to make a profit selling art on canvases and having to like build relationships with distributors and quality check things. And I, honestly, one of the reasons we never did physical stuff at scale is because it's so hard to keep the quality high. Mm -hmm. And... Um, damage stuff gets damaged in the post and doesn't show up and it's just a lot of uh unless again you want to build a big business with a bunch of people that are in charge of all those things it's not the easiest thing to do so nfts came along we had some support sold some 
pieces and then like from that point forward i've like you know it was like a quake moment kind of where i wanted to just really understand why people would buy that thing other than just being supporters of the visualized value story network you know in the same way you would support a patreon page or you know get invested in a creator that you want to just fund the continued fund their continued creation so um that's when i started to dig deeper into nft communities more specifically like the early executions like the profile picture projects that you've seen popping up um OpenSea. i remember going on OpenSea, and when i was when i first started experimenting with foundation which is in my opinion one of the like most intuitive cleanest ui um auction platforms there is right now and we're so early that you know there is no there there are no like set best practices or ui expectations and and platforms are just popping up everywhere and it remains to be seen who's going to win there but the i mean that's another point to consider is because all these things are so interoperable mm -hmm. um there's like no real massive barrier to entry to someone coming along and building the next best auction platform um so where do i go from here i think the next sort of moment for me was um open c as a platform being like a, a market for every nft on ethereum mm -hmm. so that to me is like another really fundamental shift in um access and market just a, a market a digital marketplace that is just different than any other digital marketplace right anybody can go on there and create a collection it can read the ethereum blockchain and see collections that were made in different places it's like this um you know the ebay of all digital assets but it's like it reads the chain it's not like you have to go in there and like set up your listings individually so that's the first like really um fundamental shift that got uh, got into my head and then you start to really understand how network effects or like how markets and naval has got some really good writing on this is like how blockchains turn everything into markets mm -hmm. so now you can start to understand why art if you add like massive amount of liquidity and transparency to any market it like the volume of activity increases mm -hmm. right and this is what happened with OpenSea and digital art and collectibles there were art ogs crypto ogs that were selling art on the ethereum blockchain for 50 cents a piece mm -hmm. you know in 2017 um and now their stuff is selling for you know 500 ethereum 600 ethereum 700 ethereum it's at christie's mm -hmm. there's all sorts of like crazy things happening in uh where this stuff is getting recognized in pop culture because i think it's uh like from the perspective of like an art curator this stuff is historically significant mm -hmm. like these were some of the first things to ever um these are the first pieces of art to be executed on this medium mm -hmm. and then there's that part of it but i think what drives the really crazy markets and valuations and competition there's so many layers to it there's if you talk about the profile picture projects like mm -hmm. the the crypto punks the board ape yacht club the the punks i think are widely regarded as like the first mm -hmm. profile picture project or the first popular profile picture project so you have the um for anybody that doesn't uh, is not familiar with crypto punks i think it's cryptopunks.com you go there it's 10,000 avatars they're 24 by 24 pixels they look like a you know a character from like an 8-bit game yeah. from the 80s they're all completely unique and there there's traits that are dis like rare that are distributed across them with varying degrees of rarity so you have like 10,000 total and then there's like i think aliens and apes that sit at the very very top of that uh, rarity distribution so i think there's nine 
aliens, 25 apes, and then uh, 50 zombies or something, and the rest are like human-style mm-hmm. characters. So we've seen, I think this year, we've seen a alien go for 16 million USD. Gary Vaynerchuk bought one of the ape crypto punks for five and a half million mm-hmm. USD. And then there's a lot of anonymous buyers in there as well. But to understand like why that has become this asset class that like capital is just like this sucking capital into, I think is one, it's like obviously the limited nature of it. And my first, my first reaction to it would be like, this is like you, anybody can make that thing and set it as a profile picture, right? There's a JPEG there. I can download it. I can put it as my profile picture. But I think especially people with financial backgrounds probably have a better um, understanding of how, or can get can get this faster than anybody else is that the image does have some utility as the flex right like the digital rolex thing but it's also just an abstraction of a financial asset in the same way that like a stock certificate represents a slice of this company that you're betting on and in this era I think there's a great Michael Saylor bit on this. It's like runaway successful companies Mm -hmm. are just networks. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a company and think about it like a network, it doesn't matter if you're selling like cans of Coke or iPhones or whatever it is. Your objective is to increase increase the strength of the network over time. You want more nodes joining the network and you want the connections between the the nodes and the network to strengthen. So ethereum nfts internet community the way i think about it at least is crypto punks is a network that has a proven financial track record and a status track record and um like historical provenance too so it's like triple threat crazy you know also paired with like the massive amounts of wealth created by early adopters in crypto Mm -hmm. and their um you know the emotional attachment that they have to these things Mm -hmm. too so buying into or signaling a crypto punk either is um a signal that you got into crypto early enough to get one for free or buy it for 50 bucks Mm -hmm. or that you you know are savvy enough or you've managed your money well enough or you've traded xyz to get to a point where you can purchase one and i think we vastly underestimate in general how much people care about what they look like to other people right the i think another traditional um parallel to draw is lvmh Mm -hmm. what's that dude's name arno the ceo of uh, LVMH. I, was, I, I know you're talking about. I don't know his name though. But he's, he, I think he's the richest dude in the world. Yeah. Off the back of building LVMH, and you could say, well, what utility does do LVMH products have? And I would argue, if you're talking about the Maslow's hierarchy, mm-hmm. LVMH is pretty close to the top, right? Nobody yeah. needs a Louis Vuitton bag. Nobody needs a, I don't know. They've got a bunch of booze brands and all sorts of stuff in there now, but they typically occupy the very top of the pyramid after you've got your you know your basics covered then you're going to shop at lvmh and wherever else so i do i would just extend that same idea to the digital world and i think what makes it difficult for people to understand is that anybody can it feels like the barrier to entry is so much lower like Mm -hmm. anybody can create an nft collection and i agree that's true. Anyone can buy a sewing machine and make a bag. Mm-hmm. Like you can you can draw that comparison to anything. Like just because this market is super liquid and there's a lot of activity in there, I think it it definitely means your due diligence needs to be exceptionally an exceptional degree higher mm-hmm. than buying something from the New York Stock Exchange, which obviously has to go through like layers and layers of regulation and posting all sorts of data about their operation and you know by no means should this be uh like 
everything I say is purely my um, experience of it and my essentially guess as to why this phenomenon is occurring. Mm -hmm. But the comparisons I'm trying to make are things that people kind of defend this with a logic that's already been proven false in in widely accepted markets. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me... Let me know if, if I'm going off the rails or rambling no, here, but that's I think, where I, think, I start to... I think part of it is, I, I think it's a generational difference in values. So the, the comparisons you're making are spot on. And those are the ones I try to make. It's the Rolex, the, you know, it's, it's a flex, it's type of, to show the status. Just because you don't understand why someone would value a crypto punk and why they think it's so great. Like, I don't understand why you want to spend 10 grand on a watch. Like, to me, that's, I don't even wear a watch. That's mm -hmm. silly. So, right. it, it's people are so stuck. And advisors, financial advisors are, are very bad about that. They just, they immediately say that, well, why would somebody want a digital piece of art? Like, well, why would someone want a physical piece of art? It's still, there's prints mm -hmm. of all the famous artwork out there. It's that certificate of authenticity, which is what the blockchain provides. And in, in the social status, if I were to go out and put a, bored ape is my profile on Twitter that I didn't own. People found that out. Like I would lose credibility and right, it's right. just, it's just a difference in generations and the older generation either refuses to understand it or just can't grasp it. And I think that's where the disconnect really falls. Um, there's, mm -hmm. I think I was reading an article by Bobby hundreds who'd like the, the hundreds. And for me, this was one of the aha moments to me on NFTs. He, he used the example of that banana on the wall with the uh, the tape across it. Remember that piece of art that sold for yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole bunch of money? And in the Certificate of Authenticity, it's I think it said that the original banana did not have to remain, that as that banana rotted, they could replace the banana out with a new one, tape it back up, and it would be just as authentic as the first one, which – you know, in theory, it's not because it's a different banana, but it had that certificate saying this is the one that was done by the artist. This is mm -hmm. allowed and it maintains its value um, to me that that was the thing that, oh, I, I get it. It's it's all about being able to prove that you own it um, and not that you just copied and pasted it over and used it and that people care about it and they understand it and they're going to call your bluff. And then you've lost credibility in the social status. Um, yeah, but I want I do want to go back. Well, one thing I wanted to point out just for people listening that at one point you quoted value of something in ETH, like you're 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 thinking ETH, like you. And another one you co you converted USD, but you were talking about selling it for 50, 60 ETH, and like that's mm -hmm. just that's normal for you. And I I, I want people to realize that th those that are really into this and believe in it and are putting their wealth behind it, like they're not thinking in US dollars anymore. They're thinking in ETH and BIT and Solana or whatever else that's out there. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting that you said that. Like, didn't even think twice about saying it. Um, I don't know if there's any way that you can, beyond the, the, the banana painting explanation, but yeah. the value that people see or are finding in digital art. Like, why is it that, it, like, is it because a younger generation grew up with digital? Like, what is it about digital art that you think will continue to be a trend that will sustain? Yeah, I think art is just the most obvious application of the technology, but it's about digital ownership. Mm -hmm. So you have you have kids, right? Uh, yep. Young boys. I don't know if they play computer games. Yeah. But well, no, so I'm, I'm glad you're going there. So they play Fortnite. And yep. I was walking to school with Leo a few weeks ago, my middle. And I was after I, it was actually after I got the crypto. So I showed it to him. And I was talking to him about this whole space. And he made the connection himself. He's like, oh, it's like skins in Fortnite. I was like, yeah, except you don't own the skins. If your Fortnite got wiped out, you've got to go put all your money back into Fortnite and rebuy that. Where this, I own it, and I can go resell it. Yeah. So, yeah, the gaming, the gaming. if you have kids who game, that's a good co connection there. Sorry to interrupt you, but, yeah, I, I, that's I No, exactly no, that's great. Going. No, I was uh, – yeah, that's what I was hoping you were going to say. But the idea of – so here's another, like, big thematic shift in identity. So – people who did not grow up on the internet or did not make their like transition from childhood to adulthood on the internet, which I did, like I was born in 1988. So I'm not like, I wasn't on the internet all day until, you know, I was a f fully grown adult at work. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was growing up, it was still like plug your console in and leave the cartridge, mm -hmm. leave it on all night to save the game. That's, yep. you know, that's how <laughs> old I am. So the idea that people who, uh, internet native 
so much of their identity i think is they think of their identity as beyond the physical limits of their person mm -hmm. natively right i think we all are having to adapt to that so if you think look think about the last two years that 80 percent of work can shift online without any disruption to society essentially uh, well that's i mean that's a bold claim but you know what i'm saying like yeah. the work day can go on and companies can still function um the really strange thing about that is i think maybe before covid you could argue that people's physical identity was you know they interacted more in their social circles physically than they do digitally and now your digital identity and your relationship with even your peers like a good example not investment advice i record that with bilal and trung and i've never met trung in person mm -hmm. Met him on Twitter. We've gone went back and forth with a few DMs. Bilal, I only met for the first time a month ago. Turns out we get on great, but we've been communicating on the internet for, you know, two years. And just this this fundamental shift, I'm not even talking about one particular NFT or avatar project or anything of that nature. Just the notion that it people's identity is like deeply embedded in digital and any um you know any behavior that we do in the physical world or any like instinct we have in the physical world mm -hmm. it's very hard to argue that that doesn't extend to the internet as well mm -hmm. like you're you're trying to accomplish the same things but with like a different medium and um yeah i think that is hard to get especially for people who don't feel that because i think there are there is a divide of people that the internet is a tool and you use it for doing your work or you use it for like getting clients and then you close the laptop at the end of the day and you're done right mm -hmm. but for a massive massive percentage of the population they open the laptop to socialize right mm -hmm. like a younger generation particular like they go to school and then they come back and open the computer and like get back connected with everybody that they spent the day with mm -hmm or you know and more so i think that idea of ownership just being a like an added feature or we're just like we're starting to see your the features that apply in real life start to creep into the digital world and people starting to question who owns my data who like what am I getting out of posting to TikTok eight hours a day or YouTube eight hours a day? Or, um, you know, my effort is essentially growing the market cap of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think younger kids especially have a way better grasp on that than my generation, maybe the gen like a couple of generations before me who, you know, I think... Uh, haven't been questioning this to the same degree where um the idea of web3 to me is just this really subtle shift in incentives mm -hmm. that completely changes the trajectory of like how things get built and and how things are owned and while we're just talking about nfts right now there's um i, I don't know a ton about this but i think roblox is a really good example mm -hmm. um which is like excuse me if you know what roblox is and i butcher this explanation but it's like a minecraft it's like similar to minecraft it's like there's a ton of agency in that game where you can design things make things there's marketplaces in there with like really sophisticated um uh like organizations running them like eight-year-olds that have like direct reports and like do like all sorts of different stuff and they're making their they don't own a piece of the protocol right they they're using the uh they're using the platform to make money mm -hmm. but web3 and crypto and fractional ownership and just markets that are way more flexible make it possible to you know give ownership to the people who are making the network mm -hmm. grow making it better etc cetera, etc cetera. in the same way that like if you go to starbucks every day you might own some starbucks stock mm -hmm if you're using uh like if you want to you know make clothes in roblox or you have a very specific uh thing that you do in roblox you design buildings in roblox 
why wouldn't you own a piece of Roblox or Roblox token or whatever else or get paid in that? So I think it's just like without even thinking about it as like financial infrastructure, as I think that's where people get tripped up is like they want to know the technical stuff. They want to like understand the difference between this financial instrument and that financial instrument. And I understand that from like, you can't recommend this or there's regulatory reasons for that. But if you zoom out to like what behavior is happening, mm -hmm. it's just one, it's the like the reduction in power of the middleman or the mm -hmm. the the person who is capturing margin essentially or the, the organization that's capturing margin you, re you read any chris dixon threads uh i have not but i will go look him up so i'll put you on him he's he's a partner at andreessen horowitz runs a crypto fund there i think and he has a um he has a thread i think it's titled your take rate is my opportunity. So, you know, the famous Jeff Bezos line, y your margin is my opportunity. Yeah. He's put forward this thesis that you're like, you know, as a game that's harvesting 90% of revenue from users and giving them nothing back, there's going to be a crypto native platform that does that completely differently. Maybe it takes, you know, 2% of transactions like an open sea mm -hmm. where you're not you're not like you're not giving the majority of the transaction to open sea every time you uh every time you make a transaction they're just they're just facilitating this massive market and they're mm -hmm. taking uh, like i mean arguably some people say two and a half percent is too much for what they're doing i think it's it's crazy uh the volume that they're handling they went from 20 million dollars of f transaction volume in 2020 mm -hmm to 4 billion in August of 2021. It's insane. So OpenSea is one of, yeah, OpenSea is, I think, one of the top 20 marketplaces on the planet for volume. Wow. And no physical goods are changing hands. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Um, I, but I think also, like, people in the world of finance are really kind of i think really well poised to understand this in that it's like a market like anything else where people are betting on networks mm -hmm. making emotional decisions like everybody in the financial services world has you know everybody that i've encountered at least has like been working to perfect this idea that the market is a you know this big psychological measuring stick mm -hmm. essentially right fear and greed and this is an asset class i think that just um people almost have more personal attachment to than um it's almost more resilient mm -hmm. than uh traditional markets because no one's like oh man i have to change my i have to um there's a, like you said, there's a social cost mm -hmm. to entering and exiting this thing. You signal with your reputation, um, not in the same way that if you like moved in and out of an asset, you would announce it to everybody and say like, hey, here's this thing I believe in. Mm -hmm. In some cases, that's true. But in a lot of cases, it's not. You're just, it's just, you can be very uh, black and white about it because it's numbers on a screen, right? It's a right. spreadsheet. Like this position is X. All right, I'm cutting my losses. I'm out. And I think the idea of, nfts and ownership of culture people are way more it's just a way more um it's just a very different market like people will buy you know people will support an artist they love mm -hmm. and hold that artwork for months years like not everybody is participating in this for the pure financial upside yes it helps and if you get in at this stage i think People almost think it's inevitable that, you know, you hold a blue chip NFT from the beginning of this wave that you're going to make out. All right. I have no idea if that's true or not, but it feels to me like digital, like this concept of digital ownership is going nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's just going to start to trickle into everything. Uh, you just saw, I think yesterday, TikTok announced that they're doing a NFT drop with some of their top creators. 
I'm surprised um, it took them so long to do that. Like to me, that just seems uh, obvious yeah. that they would have done it by now. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure they, uh, I don't know, building it or legal or something going on. But um, that's big news. Um, but yeah, so I think I like it's a behavior in the same way that when social media came about, everyone was like, well, who would do that? Mm -hmm. Like, that's nuts. Who, who cares about what someone's eating for dinner or like what like nonsense thought pops in your head? And and now it runs the planet, right? Like talk about politics or anything mm -hmm. that is interesting on a global scale happens on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like we all know, we can all recite examples from recent years where like the biggest stories in the world break on Twitter, the like the narrative as it exists in most people's minds is like formed through all these social networks. And now we're just adding another layer of like, you can signal, you can signal status. You can um, support an artist you believe in. You can own a piece of something that you can buy with 10 cents, right? You don't need to be an accredited investor or do whatever else. And the other part of this is the permissionless nature of getting involved in the community where you have agency to make the thing more valuable mm -hmm. um that's like going down more of a create a specific route but it's like all the stuff i've been working on for the last few years it's like you as an as a designer go out there and build your own network from scratch mm -hmm. and it's like really laborious painful like difficult job to do that versus this hey you can buy into this network let's say you're freaking crypto fanatic mm -hmm. you're like okay i'm gonna buy a crypto and then i'm just gonna make crypto animations mm -hmm. that thing has like public creative commons stuff you're already like just participating in this economy it's a computer game in the same way that any other computer game is but you have financial upside associated to that like you can increase the value of that community you can make art for people in that community you can make your own derivative project of this stuff um i'll have to send some threads over for your links too mm -hmm. um one last point on this is uh there's a guy i think his name's sir shukin on twitter and anonymous recently bought a zombie crypto punk for 2000 ethereum and in his bio it says like macro investor so this guy is like i th based on the thread i read i think a legitimate participant in financial markets mm -hmm. obviously with that amount of capital is something went right um and he talks about nfts in the context of frozen assets so he said nfts are a vehicle for unlocking frozen assets in the same way that some of the biggest businesses of the last 10 years did that. So Airbnb, mm -hmm. a frozen asset is the spare bedroom in your house. Mm -hmm. Like just impossible to monetize it. Like it would be the weirdest, oddest thing to be like trying to start a business around the spare room in your house, right? Right. A bed and breakfast, and anything. But Uber, like people's spare time was a frozen asset. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be a taxi driver. You will we'll build all the platform, blah, blah, And culture is sort of the underlying asset class that nfts unlock and i think the the big like realization is that everybody is a participant in culture everybody makes culture everybody does something to like move culture along and that idea of that you can either make it and monetize it or you can you know be invested in it and earn from your taste like mm -hmm. the predictions you make mm -hmm. i can imagine a world where um you know an artist whose song is going crazy on tiktok let's say tokenizes their album and it's like anybody who's anybody who believes in my music or loves my music can buy a piece of my album mm -hmm. and then all of those people who have bought the album can go and you know do whatever it is they do on tiktok to that song mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. so it's like it's just this this alignment of like i own this thing and i'm gonna um i can if i want to like attempt to increase the value of it or mm -hmm. like inc and it's like the it's, it's just another 
social media metric where you see people competing for eyeballs, likes, retweets, attention. Now it's like really going free market. Capital is involved in that equation as well. And NFTs, like we're talking about it as like the acronym because it's early, but I think you'll get to a stage where it's just not in the vernacular in the same way that we don't say like, hey, we're getting on a TCP IP connection to have this conversation. We're just like, hey, we're getting on a call. Right. And it just, it feels like it, that language will work its way out of the equation eventually where it's just like, yeah, I'm playing Fortnite and yeah, I happen to own my character and all of the stuff that um, you know I've amassed over the, the months and years of time I've been playing it. So the utopian version or vision for it is that like, there's wealth distribution mm -hmm. based on, you know, you owning a piece of something that is popular or useful. I don't think utility, uh, I don't think the traditional definition of utility or the way utility is normally critiqued applies here. I don't think it's applied in traditional markets for a long time either, mm -hmm. but you know, it's just, uh, I think it's a something people get tripped up on like, we're living in a society where we're way past what we need, right? And we're just sort of messing about, especially, uh, especially, you know, North America, first world country. It's like we're, it's like an entertainment, a layer of entertainment that are now becoming markets. There, there was so much in there. I wanted to interrupt and go on. But I just wanted you to keep going. I, I think one of the things that excites me about all this, and you kind of alluded to it, I, I think that this whole space nft web3 it is redistributing power as well and it, it sounds extreme but to the standpoint of in, anybody can do an nft an artist can now distribute their own money these smart contracts that the nfts are built on can build in royalties for the future that were never there before it, it just makes it easier and it's it's never been easier to start a business you can start a business from your phone like so mm -hmm. it's never been easier to start a business. Now it's never been easier to monetize things and have more control that we don't need to rely on other institutions. Again, OpenSea is taking 2%. That sounds pretty low to me. I'm not in the space, but it doesn't sound like a very high cost. If I had to go build out my own distribution or my own market, it's going to cost me a lot more than that 2%. That's what excites me is that now you have people who have been disenfranchised or left out now they at least have a shot. They can go start something mm -hmm. on their own. Now they got to work hard. And it's not going to be, not everybody's going to be successful right away, but at least the opportunity is there where the opportunity wasn't there before. That's to me what is really exciting. Um, and we didn't even really go deep. Like we talked about the art NFT, but like you think about what NFTs can do for music and artists and the experiences they can create with that um, or a up and coming artist. Like to your point, there could be somebody in your, your, or a friend of yours that's getting started and they sell one of their songs. And if they, end up getting real big, you could have this you know, early edition song that you bought um, to support your friend, to get them going so they had capital to go, and now that's worth it, and hopefully they built in, they get a royalty off of that when you go sell to make money, and I just, mm -hmm. I, 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 I wanna see the creators benefit from their work, not the investors. Like, you know, you think about the, yeah. all the famous artists in the past, they made their money when they sold their art their one time, and then that, that art appreciated multiples over the years and when it was sold to the next rich person to the next rich person that artist who did all the work got nothing out of it um so that's yeah, what yeah, really yeah. excites me is to see maybe there's a little bit more opportunity for dis distribution of wealth and power and all this um there's another area i wanted to dive a little bit deeper on is the value of community so like i understand the value of community you know, we started the agc advisors getting together and like there's that there's that benefit of community but then when it comes to, I, I want to see if maybe you can do a better job explaining how community supports something like a crypto punk or a board ape. Like how does a group of people who somehow all identify with this, this project, how are they able to establish a floor and keep that value there? Like it's something that I, I think is hard for people to grasp that just uh, that community is that value. A lot of companies now are talking about starting communities. I think there's a huge opportunity. I think community, whether this is one of those things, I don't know if you intentionally built community the way you did or if just through your work and who you are, community naturally came. I think the less intentional you are about building your community, the better, the more authentic it is, the more genuine. That's kind of the best way to grow it. 
but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how how does this community component drive the value for these projects you touched on it yeah, some but I didn't, know if there's, I didn't know if there's any further depth to it that you've experienced with your own experiences or i know when you talked in um non-investment advice like when you look at the projects community is something you're looking at so like when you're looking for community like what do you see as signals this is a strong community like what are those characteristics because yeah, yeah. i think that can help advisors understand why these things have these value and how important community behind it is yeah it's a great question so the first part of it i think you're spot on in that like going the more obvious you're trying to build community the like the harder time you're going to have right it's like going into a, a party or something and being like hey do you want to join my community <laughs> everyone's going to run a mile away from you right? this it's, it's just not yeah exactly it's like it, it has to be this magnetic process where you know either um either there's something that you've something out there that represents you that make people like interested in in getting together in a more intimate setting so like visualized value i think is this slow drip of uh, basically a world view right it's like how, how these ideas are things that i appreciate that i will like interpret and put back out there and what that's done is just build a network of people that think the same way or appreciate those same ideas and that is i think like foundationally what all of this stuff is about um and in these in these like very nascent profile picture examples or these communities that are built around art i think this is a great sort of checklist where the first of its kind tends to have this like level of support that's really um like incredibly strong mm -hmm. so you're looking for things that are unique that aren't necessarily utility based right i think crypto punks being the first widely widely recognized like on chain um avatar project is like that's carrying uh that's carrying a lot of the weight there and there's just precedence that's been set by the types of people and the weight that they carry in the space mm -hmm. saying this is the thing right this we see this as valuable in the same way that like people who were off white in celebrity culture is like okay that's the top that's the top gear because the people i respect and that make taste in this space mm -hmm. are wearing that stuff and i want to wear it mm -hmm. too so i think there's like all this stuff is definitely um like this is not fundamental analysis in the same way that like we sell x number of units at this rate and we have distribution in all these stores mm -hmm. but you know it's getting close at this point like you get something gets culturally entrenched to the point where it can't be unseated especially if it's like a mile like a time milestone where this was the first thing mm -hmm. that feels to me like a for a cultural object that's a good moat mm -hmm. right and then board apes i would say the f thing that they did first was the commercial rights on the apes mm -hmm. so if you uh, if you own one you have the commercial rights to do whatever you want with it. So I could go and start well, there's a, a there was clothing an, brand. Wasn't there an ape that just signed a deal with a marketing agency? Yeah. So someone's like um, CAA, I think they've got like screenwriters, California Screenwriters Guild or something, that they're doing a yeah full-on like book and TV series and whatever else with it. TV series, I don't know. Something. You, it's, it's someone, the valet, the valet ape. You can look it up. Um, but yeah, they did something completely unique there which i think again is like one it's like you've got the people who have conviction about ethereum two you have the conviction about people like decentralizing um creative industries and media industries mm -hmm. and and then like obviously there's the layer of like the people just like what it looks like and they're prepared to like replace an image of themselves with this thing mm -hmm. and i think a lot of that energy flowed into those early communities and i'm not saying everything has to be first but there's definitely a like it has to give you a unique vibe i think like the um the, and this is again i tweeted this a while ago vibes are the new fundamentals and it's, it sounds ridiculous vibe analyst i tweeted that yesterday too mm -hmm. where like this thing these these communities and this stuff is just like 
it's almost like um because we have an instrument to uh like quantify culture or we we like uh crypto markets just and nfts allow us to like add ownership to pieces of culture it's like the vibe check thing like you would get in high school where it's like this is you know this person gets it or knows how to dress and this person doesn't there's there is this underlying like you can't describe it you get you just you just get it instantly or you go in a room and you meet a bunch of people and you're like these are my people and you walk in a different room you're like yeah these aren't my people mm -hmm. right that's probably you know and if you change places with anyone um that equation would be different so i think having a layer of infrastructure that makes it possible to like own a piece of that vibe mm -hmm. is what's happening here. And that in some cases the art can just be strong enough where that carries the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? There are artists that just have an aesthetic that resonates with the right types of people and that is doing it. Um, but in other cases you go in communities where like, when are we building the game and what's going to be next on this thing? That's one thing I really love about that Cryptodes project. Mm -hmm. They literally said, we don't have a roadmap. We're not going to do, we're not promising anything. We're just like, this is just pure vibe. Mm -hmm. Resonated with me massively but just because it's also a response in real time to the where this culture is going. Right. Right? And, and I think that, again, they just tapped into the zeitgeist in the same way that a, a brilliant fashion designer would. Mm -hmm. Um and created something that represented like you know we're not going to be in there checking the floor price of the thing every five minutes mm -hmm. because those communities just eat themselves alive in the same way as like the forex trading of nfts right you're not in there to you're not in there because you believe in the community or the business or the network you're in there to like just try and you know scalp and and get out so uh yeah i think I don't know if that gave any actionable uh, insight whatsoever, but the um, the the only way to learn it is just to like get in there and see if it's like if you feel something, then the idea like you can extrapolate that feeling to other people, mm -hmm. and that's how all you know businesses and networks function. Is if you know this this thing is like you know I'm gonna make an irrational decision about this thing because I love it. You can you know there's there's other people that feel that way and um yeah i think even sometimes you'll have that feeling and you'll be there won't be enough people that love it as much as you do right. or something else comes along that can replace it and that's the crazy part about this market is it's very easy to move out of a community if you don't have that mm -hmm. connection or if you don't have that like hey we're waiting for this thing to happen in six months and we're really pumped about it like the things that Board Ape Yacht Club is announcing now are just like obscene. It's like we're building a physical social club in Miami and we're, you know, doing a, it's just like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that, I think the, you know, the price of the asset tracks to that in some ways, but you can't put that into a spreadsheet and be like, well, that's worth exactly this. Right. Um, and I think it's like still, there's still the arbitrage of like the people who, rode the nft wave really well mm -hmm. there's ten thousand people is not a big number that's another interesting thing like when you in your personal life you think ten thousand is a big like ten thousand is a lot of people mm -hmm. you go to madison square garden it's half full right and they fill up madison square garden every night of the week mm -hmm. every day of the year with twenty thousand people and that's just in new york mm -hmm. So that like the context of scale for me is like really helpful too. Whereas like you'll drive past a office building in a decent sized city, two and a half thousand people working there. Mm -hmm. On one block, there's 20,000 people working somewhere. So it's not hard to imagine with a market that has no like, you know, no barriers on like nationality, borders, language, whatever else that you can get you can drive an insane amount of demand for something that there's only 10,000 of. Um, and that's, I don't know, I'm not an economics major or a professor or anything, but like scarcity 101, um, this is like that on absolute steroids. Yeah, I've, I, I feel like we're living a case study in behavioral finance and psychology. Like we're just, we're just seeing it, whether it be, you know, FOMO and herd mentality, 
anchoring to pricing. Like this is a real life case study that we're going to look back and we're going to be able to identify all these things. And actually, I think see where, where some of this stuff has moved to and kind of grown over time as well. Um, I, I want to make sure we bring some attention to some of the cool things going on with NFTs that are like not about people making or growing their wealth, but actually doing good. So you mm -hmm. had the project for Afghanistan where you sold NFTs as a fundraiser. Um, I'll make sure I link to the, the podcast episode where you go more into detail on that. So you don't have to go too deep, but just kind of talk about how you were able to take this NFT market. And then instead of making it for your bottom line, you did a lot of good for families over in Afghanistan. Yeah. So, um, another, another fascinating thing about crypto is you don't need permission to send money anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, but if I'd have collected money myself and put it in my bank account, I've got like taxable, taxable events, like transmitting money to charities. I've got all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Got to give receipts to everybody that donated all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So this this story broke. Obviously, anyone listening to this is probably familiar. Bunch of like just a massive amount of dis displacement of families in Afghanistan uh, a couple months ago. And I was like, OK, what can I do? Like, you know, I could donate money myself. I could set up GoFundMe stuff. But what is it that my network is uniquely positioned to do to help right now? And I've been working in the NFT space, making NFTs, thinking about NFTs a lot. And I was like, okay, what if I made an NFT that represents a donation? So I found this charity called Care. They do a care package for um, one family. It's 90 bucks and it's 30 days of emergency supply supplies for a family. So it makes it tangible, right? That in itself is a great way to like run a philanthropic campaign because mm -hmm. people can understand what they're doing and how they're helping. But to uh, donate a, traditionally, you would have a line on your credit card statement mm -hmm. for that donation, mm -hmm. right? Which nothing wrong with that, great. People should definitely keep donating money to causes. With an NFT abstracted from that, you're like, you're, you're, you're kind of accomplishing two goals there. You know when people used to change their Facebook profile picture, so like, here's the cause that I yeah. support, or this event just happened, I'm gonna put the frame around. Um, this is like that one step further where it's proof of donation mm -hmm. um where you talk about skin in the game of like a community that you believe in and you wear your um you wear watch x or clothing brand y when you go to like charity galas this is like a representation of a donation that you made or a cause that you care about which again like would be if we were like completely candid about it, it's like, it doesn't make people look bad when they donate to charity, mm -hmm. right? It's this idea that there's a social signal that you care about X. And I think NFTs eventually, or like wallets in general, will be this like, essentially a portfolio of either like things you believe in or things you support. Mm -hmm. And that, that the wallet is really like, um, a companion to a social feed and this is like this is what i think this is what i say and then my wallet this is what i've done right right and i think that will extend to all types of credentialing where say you complete online course x mm -hmm. you get issued an nft based on uh you know that you completed with x amount an x amount of time or with x uh, x amount of proficiency um and that thing can't change wallets you if you try and move it, it burns itself, you know, smart contract, mm -hmm. you can write all that in code. So the stuff that we're talking about on R is really just like scratching the surface of like the basic applications of this stuff where it's like, okay, here's an asset that we can trade back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not too into DeFi, but the idea that all of these complex financial instruments can be executed this way too, I think it's going to take a long time before that stuff gets consumer ready because it's mm -hmm. so incredibly intimidating right now in a lot of cases. And um, I just think it's like, imagine everything that we developed in like meat space, like in physical commerce, we're doing like the same thing digitally and just tackling like the most obvious applications of it mm -hmm. for or like the most tangible applications of it based on the fact that it's digital. 
we'll get to the more intangible stuff like property deeds cap tables and that stuff you know there's DAOs and people that are figuring that stuff out mm -hmm. it's honestly like a little bit out of my reach just because i don't spend as much time in that world but anything that is like anything that involves ownership in the physical world mm -hmm. will be you know there will be an nft application that gets developed for that to like you say just completely um completely strip out any kind of um nonsense in a lot of cases music is a great example where it's like if i sign on to a streaming platform or if i sign to a label let's say and i have a commission x cut out but there's all of these stipulations in the contract where it's like oh we're not paying you that this because of this and you know we we didn't get as many plays as we thought we were going to get versus like hey justin gets x percent of every you know every um play that gets like where the finances are like in this wallet mm -hmm. it's like determined from day zero you sign like your your ethereum address is in the smart contract it's done versus like you know the 12 lawyers that you have to review on a quarterly basis and renegotiate your stuff which you know comes with its own challenges because you're signing deals that are you know potentially long lasting right. but there's 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 a great platform called indify that i was going to bring up when you brought up music mm -hmm. which is which is not crypto right now i met the founder at, at um bitcoin miami actually he's like not a crypto guy wasn't a crypto guy then but is now but <laughs> you'll go down to crypto should, miami uh, and then come back not a crypto yeah, person <laughs> exactly and uh he um they've they built this amazing uh platform him and his co-founder they worked at a music label and built a tool for basically analyzing trends in music mm -hmm. and they've pivoted in the last year to um basically letting people be seed investors in artists that's awesome and the idea that you can build, you can invest in an artist on really favorable terms more so than a label would mm -hmm. and that music is actually a very very safe and predictable investment mm -hmm. more so than most startups right where you're writing you're writing a check into oblivion most of the time because mm -hmm. they need they need um they need an incredible amount of traction, product market fit and customer retention versus a piece of music where you can say, hey, a thousand people played this and, you know, 800 of them got to the end and 650 of them listened to it five times. Mm -hmm. So we know based on all of the information we, we understand about the music world that this is a, a banger tune. Mm -hmm. So we're going to like put some capital behind it. And uh, that to me is like, in di like that's the crypto ethos but it's actually being executed as a like in the fiat world right now as all traditional contracts and things but they'll eventually they'll eventually build that on crypto um i need to go check that out that to I, cause I, I love yeah, music and i was telling somebody this like how if i could do anything if i didn't have to work i would i would want to learn to be uh, become a music producer like rap i want to make beats i want to be dr dre yeah 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 but when i was so to date myself i'm a little older than you every tuesday was new music tuesday i'd leave high school i'd go to best buy pick up the latest cd bust it open and i would go through and i would see who produced every song who's featured on it like i would i would read through it before i listen then i would put it in and i would preview every song like 15 20 seconds skip to the next one and just like get my first feelings and I don't know if – so I don't know if this is I have talent with with my ear or if just good – maybe it's the trends. Good music is always good music, and it's going to be hits. Yeah, but yeah. I would be able to predict what ones, what songs were going to be future releases before they came out. Um, so that would be really, really cool. But think, like, think of it as an artist. If you go this route, yeah, the music label has incentive for you to do well, but they've got a bunch of artists that they have. So if you don't do well, they've got another one who will. But – if you're using your fans to seed you, not only do you, your fans have a vested interest in you, they, A, they love you, so they're going to support you and talk about you anyways, but if they can get more people streaming your songs, that means their, their initial investment in you becomes more as well. So now you build out this network effect with your fans that they get incentivized by promoting you. Like if I was, if I got a commission for every time I wore like a Jack Butcher hat or a t-shirt, like that would be awesome. Like I'm going to keep on buying yeah, it and sick. I'm going to wear it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where we're going. I, and uh, like, just as you like, 
I think this is a good um, anchor to try and put down. It's like, this is really culture as an asset class in a, like, it unlocks culture as an asset class. And you have the smartest people in the world working on ways to make this happen. And like how excited you were explaining that is like more excited than most people get talking about the S&P 500 or, you know, oil futures or whatever else, all of which are incredibly important and, you know, make the world turn. But culture is an asset. It's just the infrastructure hasn't existed and the incentive structure and the like gated distribution where like if you want to be a if you want your song on the radio you there's a certain path that you have to go right there until you have the scale where you can you know do your own thing and start your own label yes it's like a it's a system that you have to compete in but this is like um the amount of capital that is getting put in the hands of the people who are making culture firsthand is different than ever before, right? Even the difference between OpenSea and Christie's, like Christie's is uh, still taking 35, 40% off the top. I don't really understand. I think there's obviously a brand play there of all these crypto auctions going through Christie's, but that I don't think we need them. So... Real quick, um, before I have, I have a final question I want to ask you because I don't, I have no idea what this answer is going to be. But we've talked about culture, and I, like that could probably be a whole episode on its own, and I could probably talk to you for like four hours on this stuff. But culture is something that is value that, that I value, that I understand, and when you say that, it makes sense. I don't know if everybody understands when we talk about the value of culture. Like, what do you mean when you say that? Because like, I, there's some people who probably don't even understand it all, and they're just thinking of like culture of where somebody's from, like their heritage culture right, right, versus right, right. like the culture of, of people and what's important. Like how do you define culture and how do you, uh, how does somebody, if they're not able to identify, like what are they looking for? Like what does culture mean? Yeah. So I think every, like I get, I, your response makes total sense. And culture, like this idea of what people spend their time and attention and love on is valuable. Mm -hmm. So like, Another good analogy or another good prediction in this space is that people are going to be able to own parts of sports franchises. Mm -hmm. So if you're like a diehard, like football, you know, whatever NFL team it is you support, like to the point where you're buying the jerseys every year, watching six games a week onto whatever crazy American football schedule is on TV all the time, like you, I think you would describe that as like, you know, that's a part of the culture that you subscribe to, but how easy is it for you to get exposure to that asset mm -hmm. or the, the, uh, like the restaurant that you love eating at or the, um, music that you love listening to or the TV show that you watch. This is like, um, this to me is all really, comes down to like attention being one of the like we talk we talked about the like maslow mm -hmm. hierarchy and attention being like this underlying driver of asset values of some of the biggest companies in the world mm -hmm. right like the apple what biggest private company in the world is essentially a like i've used this analogy i think i said it on investment advice yesterday but you have this little screen mm -hmm. where it's like this is your like it's an aggregator of human attention it puts it puts attention in in different places all day long and that's one response i would have to people that say like digital stuff isn't real like the only reason you have an iphone is to look at digital stuff right. and they're you know incredibly valuable as a business because of it but the larger point is like attention or like the use of something in the same way that people talk about like a company is only valuable if people use the product these like you know culture and not like i think this is where people get offended too it's like oh, we don't want to monetize everything or we don't want to productize everything or everything's not an investment vehicle mm -hmm. and it's like it is but you're just not the investor right somebody is making money off this thing if you're watching it if it's being beamed into your house if you're going driving to 
the cinema or the stadium or whatever else, it is an investment vehicle. It's just you don't have exposure to it. You're not allowed to invest in it or you're not able to. Um, but somebody put capital into it and it continues because more capital comes out of it than went in, at least for, you know, in most cases, mm -hmm. right? Um, so to me, it's just like the evolution of like, you know, in the same way that the only business 200 years ago was a farm, it's like we're just evolving beyond like doing things that are purely the utility of keeping us alive mm -hmm. to keeping us entertained. So all of these principles of like, having shared ownership in something that we value crypto is just like a the infrastructure on top of that it's not like it didn't make those things valuable mm -hmm. it just makes it possible for like people to develop instruments without permission to invest in stuff um and who knows where it goes regulation wise and there's a ton of questions to be answered there but even in the short period of time where it's gotten you know, six months, nine months of like relatively mainstream attention, the speed at which this space moves is just absolutely bonkers. I lied. I had one more question. Should be too long, Go but on. this is, this is a podcast for financial advisors. And I think that what we, so I started a startup earlier this year as well. So I still have my practice, but I'm working at OnRamp as well. And Tyrone, our CEO always talks about how the financial advisor relationship is going to change. What clients are going to want from their clients is from their advisors is different in the future than what they've wanted in the past. And I think that someone like yourself would probably be a prime example of that. You're probably not going to have the majority of your net worth in traditional ETFs, mutual funds, stocks, and bonds. You're probably going to have it. You've got your business, you've got NFTs, you've got other things going on. You're probably going to be investing in opportunities that come to you. When you think of working with a financial advisor, because I think more and more young professionals are going to be like you. What is like? How would an advisor structure a relationship to be a value add to you to where you would actually want to hire them? Mm -hmm. So my like, I always think of it as like the financial quarterback, mm -hmm. right? The idea that there is there's basically I'm going to figure out how to make money as effectively as I can, mm -hmm. and like my like the administrative stuff that is just so impossible for me to wrap my head around like um life insurance health insurance uh like good cpa mm -hmm. like if i've just invested in some new thing like what do i what do i need to document how do i need to take care of it how do i need to fight like to me it's like if you could I'm, I want to make the financial decisions, honestly, mm -hmm. but I want to essentially like it's more on the compliance side and the um, structure side and the sensibility side where I just there's not enough hours in the day to keep track of that stuff. And it's just like painfully horrible to deal with for someone who's just not built that way. And I think people who get into the financial advising game are likely good at that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. You can you can. Like that lights you up, like sitting in front of a empty Illustrator document mm -hmm. lights me up. So I think everybody's financial situation because of this is going to get a hundred times more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I think there's opportunity there where you're not, you're, you're like a steward in a sense that you like, man, I mean, managing money is like, is not necessarily about where it goes right it's like more about giving you a picture of what's happening and like making sure stuff doesn't go like off the rails from a legal and compliance perspective mm -hmm. that's where it feels like um the most utility is for me um no that's perfect and i think there's like uh, that, yeah that's good no, I, no. I was just gonna say i think there's like good i think there's uh i think there's um I'll, I'll tell like be completely frank like we've churned through so many different financial advisors planners cpas because there's like oh no we don't do that we only do this or we have a very specific thing. it's like the world is going too fast for you for for that to be a viable strategy for someone like me in particular where it's like i don't even know how i'm going to be making money in six months i honestly have no idea mm -hmm. 
I have a vague idea, like this is kind of the direction of the business, but like operating on like a much shorter time frame is like the the quarterback or the like financial strategist or the somebody to bounce ideas off of like in a way that's not going to be like you're a complete nutcase right like if i phoned up some of my old financial advisors be like hey i just spent a hundred thousand dollars on this monkey photo what what do i need to do next i haven't done that but you know what i mean yeah. uh there's plenty of people who have and i think there's like uh maybe the connotation is or sorry the the reputation of the financial advisor is it's like people are like embarrassed or they feel scared to even say uh like i made this decision or i did this thing and if you can like honestly just make people feel uh okay to just actually admit what they're doing with their money and what they believe and things that cuz you know it's all stories that people believe in i think it's um especially as investing becomes like investing is pop culture now right and like it's not this thing that you just uh it's not this thing that you just automate and leave for a lot of people anyway and i think that's going to become more true with with younger people um where there really is opportunity is okay well you know what the tax implications of that are or you know you could custody this here or this is um you know stuff like you're we're we're new parents mm -hmm. and that your financial situation gets crazy complicated then right it's like um i'm rambling man because i've i'm still uh like we we have one person that we work with that kind of fills this role where i could just say any crazy shit and be like what do you think mm -hmm. and they're either like i can do this or go and talk to this person mm -hmm. and then if you need me to like be the bridge between then I can do it. So I, that was perfect, um, and I I'm glad you kept I'm glad you kept going after I was started to cut in because what you so the old way and it's dominates the profession still. It's all about the investments. It's all about the the generating the wealth. How do you create wealth? And what I the podcast is the advisor of tomorrow. I know that's not how things are going to be forever, and I know a lot of advisors get that as well. But the mass don't. They're still stuck with portfolio is the greatest value that we can bring. And you, you just explained it. It's, it's not about the portfolio. You advisors may never do any investing for their clients, but it's all about the coordination of everything else. The estate planning, the insurance, college mm. planning for a business owner, like figuring out how do you, how do you make sure if your idea for the next six months takes nine months, you until you're okay. You know what I mean? Like yes. that's where it yeah. needs to be. Going. It's going to be, it's, it's shifting more to the planning as opposed to the investing. And so that, that was great. Um, that's because that's what I wanted. I yeah. want advisors to understand that if they're going to be in this for the next 20, 30 years, they've got to adapt their business to where things are going, which is directly what you, you, you explained. Like so a lot of young professionals are generating their wealth completely on their own through this investing, you know, through COVID you look at everybody mm -hmm. getting in Robin hood and investing in the wealth that was generated. now there may have been a little bit of luck there, but now they've kind of learned some things and, doing it firsthand is the best way to learn. So while maybe the advisor should come in and say, no, Jack, don't spend a hundred grand in that, that board ape set, you know, max it at right, 75,000 right. instead of a hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but still let you go do that because you've got to be able to own your financial decisions. Now we got to make sure we don't let you like put you out of house at home, but also go off the cliff, yeah, yeah. help you go the direction that you want to go. Well, my thing is like, I'm not like I've, I've frozen my business, but if, if, and when I go back to taking on new clients, what I'm trying to reshape the relationship with my current clients is I want to make sure that people have aligned their money with their values. And that money doesn't necessarily have mm. to be traditional investments. It's, it's what it is they're doing and ultimately help them live a life of minimal regret. So walk them through the decisions. What's the trade off of doing this? What's the opportunity cost? Have we looked at all the, the all the ways it could blow up? And if we have, and you're comfortable with that risk, then, then go do that. And you've made that decision. And now we move forward with the next phase of your, of your, of your planning. So I really want advisors to understand that. So I think you articulated that perfectly. So now I get to my last question. This is the one I ask everybody. Um, if you, I don't know if you go speak at conferences, I don't know if the, the marketing world has these like for where you would go, but pretend you were a keynote speaking and they bring you out to speak in front of everybody and you get to pick your walkout song. I, I told you I love music. What would be your walkout song? And there's two, oh, if you haven't thought about it, two ways you could think about it. You could pick the song to hype up the audience or you could pick the song to hype yourself up. 
Um, I got it in my uh, uh, I I know the song. I'm just trying to think of the title. I have it in a sec. You can sing it for us. <laughs> 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 kidding, kidding. <laughs> uh, Meek Mill. Okay. Classic. Classic by Meek Mill. Yeah. And I'm gonna see if I can find the video for it, and I'll put it in there as well. I didn't know. I, I honestly, I, I feel like. Well, I feel like I know you just from social media. I don't really like. I know a little bit about you, but I I don't think I had any idea what the music would be. So I didn't know what genre you're gonna come back with. So I would. I don't. I don't know that song by by, by Meek Mill. I've never shared mine. My song would be uh, "Middle Child" by J Cole. Um, and and I, a I love the song. The beat and everything hypes me up. But I kind of view myself in my space as that middle child in that. I'm I'll be 40 in February, so I'm on the old I'm I'm getting to the older side of the business and I know a lot of the old guard, the OGs in the business. But I am young enough at heart and stay up to date with culture and pop culture and everything that I relate to a lot of the younger advisors. So I sit here in this middle spot that I can be the bridge between the young and the old, help the old pull from the young, help the young learn from the old and I'm kind of that person in the middle. And then now I'm also learning that I'm also filling that role in the traditional financial planning world and then the futuristic, you know, the crypto financial planning role with my my role at OnRamp. And I've been in crypto for a few years now so that I'm just bridging this gap for these different worlds in financial planning. So that would be my my my. So there's a line in there I love where he talks about how he left a, a recording studio with Savage 21 to go meet with Jay-Z. And he's like that bridge in between. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I will yeah, find that yeah. Meek Mill song. At minimum, I'll link to the song if I find the video. So, all right, man, it's time to close it out. Like, I seriously could have kept on going forever. I really appreciate you taking the time to hop on with me. Um, I know you're busy. I know you got your family. Where can everybody find you and plug anything that you want to plug? Um, I'll link to the podcast and everything, but anything else you want to put on the radar for people? Just, yeah, just Twitter is good. So, uh, at Jack Butcher and at Visualize Value. And likewise, man, I could have gone... Um, particularly on that last point about like what a financial advisor um like what we look for or like i think definitely people underestimate the value of just like being a sounding board too um i think people are reluctant to say that's what they want you know people you know everyone wants to buy the like set menu of services but what you really want is somebody that's like gonna take you seriously and um and make you feel comfortable to like talk about money, which is really, really hard to get people to do. Um, and I, th sorry if I'm going on too much, but it just like really struck a chord with me. The idea of like the world is getting more unpredictable and that is doing like, that's doing things to people's mental models of money. That's really difficult to, I think, understand where, it's getting more unpredictable so you want a more you want a nest egg and you want a predictable you want like that like baseline security and protection in place but it's also getting pr unpredictable in the way that if your financial advisor isn't like on the pulse that you could miss out on these just ludicrous opportunities right because there's there's exponential things happening in the world so and i totally agree with your idea of value systems and there's enough there's in the same way this community idea exists right where if you have a very specific vision there's enough people in the world that think very very similarly to you that you can guide a group of people that have the same kind of uh financial risk tolerance and uh, values and you know similar businesses things of that nature so it feels like trying to do too many things for too many people as in every business dilutes the product to the point where everyone feels a little bit like oh, i'm not quite we're not quite a match mm -hmm. so uh anyway i would honestly come back and talk about that for another hour because i think it's fascinating well i'm uh you should have never put that out there in the universe i'm gonna hit you back up that another <laughs> day man it, any any opportunity to chat with you i'll take it so I'll, I'll let some time go by and I'll, and I'll hit you back up on that um some other time and i know that people would really want to hear that as well that'll be one of the ones where i open up the live recording to the agc and let them listen to us talk about it and then ask you a couple of questions at the end. So I'll take you up. Well, Hey man, um, 
this was awesome. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all you do. Um, you are a huge source of inspiration for me. I know it sounds silly as a financial advisor, but your creativity inspires me to be creative and think outside the box. So um, this was a huge honor for me. So I appreciate it, man. Mate, it was fun. And, and not at all. I think uh, more people need to be thinking the way you're thinking. It's uh, for anybody to think like being creative as a financial advisor is silly is not smart. It's not going to work. So uh, we got to, uh, we've all got to get as creative as we possibly can, man. That's what the world demands right now. I agree. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Everybody, thanks for watching and listening. Check the show notes. Follow Jack if you're not already. And we'll see you all in the next episode. Cheers, Justin.